Theistic Evolution Critique, B.B. Warfield. We've been uh, studying the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique, and we are coming now to the very last chapter, or as you will see from the title, almost a, an addendum. Uh, w the book is written uh, looking at how the world was created. Um, one can choose to explain it by young life creationism of various stripes. One can choose to look at it from old earth creationism, which is actually better termed old life creationism because the, the uh, theological differences uh, lie there. One can choose to look at it from a point of view of theistic evolution, but one which is friendly to intelligent design uh, that allows for miracles, uh, just that things gradually gra graded into each other. One can look at it from the point of view of a theistic evolution that claims that you cannot tell if God was available or not, um, because it looks like he didn't have to do anything. And then there is flat-out atheistic evolution that says that the reason you can't tell is because there really isn't a God to begin with, and so of course he's not active in, um, in nature. And uh, this book is not primarily against atheistic evolution. It is primarily against a non-intelligent design theistic evolution. This chapter is written by Fred G. Zaspel, and it is in section three, the biblical and theological critique of theistic evolution. And it's entitled Additional Note. So this is kind of an addendum. B.B. Warfield did not endorse theistic evolution as it is understood today. It has a very short summary. This chapter quotes extensively from published and unpublished writings of Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield on creation and evolution, demonstrating that Warfield did not endorse theistic evolution as it is understood and advocated today. Very short and sweet, but for some of you who are not familiar with B.B. Uh, Warfield, it may be worthwhile giving some background. Um, Christian theology, as we saw uh, last week, uh, classical Christian theology uh, had a more or less homogeneous position. Um, and then split into several branches, the Orthodox Catholic split happening at about the turn of the millennium, uh, Protestant Catholic split coming about 15, 17 plus uh, AD. The, uh, a another split took place within Protestantism, but took Catholics, some Catholics along with it. Um, actually not very effective in the, uh, in the East, where there was, uh, it was attempted to explain Christianity without recourse to miracles because miracles were not in keeping with the spirit of the age and produced what is liberal, uh, called liberalism or sometimes called modernism. Um, and there was a reaction to that in something called fundamentalism. And there's a reason why it was called fundamentalism and it was actually a self-designated uh, Label, but of course got ad adopted by both sides describing it fairly rapidly. Um, and there are various Hodges. There's uh, uh, Charles Hodges, A.A. Uh, A. Hodge, there's Charles Hodge Jr., and I'm not going to try to sort those out, but al along with them uh, is a fellow by the name of B.B. Warfield. And... Um, it's probably worthwhile asking, what in the world is fundamentalism? Well, it, fundamentalism is a belief in the fundamentals of Christianity. And some of these may be familiar to you. This um, source is Wikipedia, and so you take it with a small grain of salt. 
The inerrancy of the Bible was one of them, yes. The literal nature of the biblical accounts, especially regarding Christ's miracles and the creation account in Genesis. Actually, Christ's miracles uh, featured more prominently than the creation account in Genesis, as we will see. The virgin birth of Christ, the bodily resurrection and physical return of Christ, and the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. Those were felt to be the core beliefs of Christianity. You let go of those, you were in deep trouble. Now, uh, we'll begin with that background so that you understand who B.B. Warfield was and, and why uh, there's some argument over uh, what he had, to, what he believed, and what he had to say, and then we'll try to come back to the perspective at the end. Um, the chapter begins, despite the play, claims of some recent, recent authors, and we'll come to that note in just a minute. A renowned Princeton theology professor, Benjamin Breckenridge uh, Warfield, you can see why they called him BB was not a theistic evolutionist. In fact, those on both sides of the evolution question who might like to claim him will find him somewhat of a disappointment for different reasons. That is, he spoke with obvious openness to the possibility of evolution if it could be established with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. However, throughout his career, he remained skeptical on exactly this score, often even mocking the theory's speculative nature and lack of supporting evidence. Uh, the note uh, includes several references, uh, but the most important one is Mark Knoll, B.B. Uh, Warfield, a biblical inerrantist as evolutionist, which gives you a picture of what is going to be claimed and what Zaspil will be writing against. Warfield maintained an obvious interest in the subject throughout his life. And the, of evolution, that is, and throughout and through to the end, his writings reflect both his openness and his critical suspicion regarding the theory. At the end of it all, we must conclude that although Warfield allowed for the possibility of evolution, he himself remained uncommitted to it, and he clearly rejected most of its main components, most of the main components of theistic evolution as it is understood today. Uh, Warfield and evolution in summary. Warfield makes it it a point to affirm the complete truthfulness of both volumes of divine revelation, scripture and the created order, and that there can be no conflict between the two. He is therefore very willing to allow the established facts of the one to check our interpretations of the other. He recognizes that biblical interpreters, no less than interpreters of physical science, can err, and so he is willing to adjust even his own understanding of scripture to the established facts of scientific under findings once and if those facts are established. However, he does not view both volumes of Revelation as equal in clarity. So he argues that due weight of consideration must be granted accordingly. Interpretations of general revelation must give way to the clearer statements of special revelation. Remarks in his review of Luther Townsend's Evolution or Creation illustrate his thinking well. Regar rejecting not merely the naturalistic, but also the timidly supernaturalistic answers. That's an interesting phrase. He insists that man came into the world just as the Bible says he did. Professor Townsend has his feet planted here on the rock. When it is a question of scriptural declaration versus human conjecture dignified by any name, whether that of philosophy or that of science, the Christian man will know where his belief is due. Professor Townsend's trust in the affirmations of the word of God as the end of all strife will commend itself to every Christian heart. Now, here Warfield is clear in his conviction that where physical sciences claim con contradict the plain written word, they must be rejected. Scripture alone is the final test of truth. It must be emphasized that Warfield continually reflected a willingness to consider the evolutionist scientific claims. Throughout his life, he very clearly kept abreast of their writings and seemed very much at home distinguishing the arguments of one scientist over against another, and of one evolutionary theory over another, and often he reflects striking openness to the idea. For example, in his lecture entitled Evolution or Development, prepared in 1888, he writes, the upshot of the whole matter is that there is no necessary antagonism of Christianity to the evolution, provided that we do not hold two on to two extreme 
a form of evolution. To adopt any form that does not permit God freely to work apart from law and that does not allow miraculous intervention in the giving of the soul and creating Eve, etc., will entail a general reconstruction of Christian doctrine and a very great lowering of the detailed authority of the Bible. But if we condition the theory by allowing the constant oversight of God in the whole process in his occasional supernatural interference for the production of new beginnings by an actual output of creative force producing something new, that is something not included even in uh, passe or potentially, in preceding conditions, we may hold to the modified theory of evolution and be Christians in the ordinary orthodox sense. Which sounds like he would accept the earlier C.S. Lewis and the later, of course, as orthodox Christian. I say we may do this. Whether we ought to accept evolution, even in this modified sense, is another matter, and I leave it purposely an open question. This kind of openness on the question is common in Warfield. Throughout his many reviews of evolutionary literature, he routinely speaks of evolution as impossible apart from divine intrusion and purpose as immediate creation, and he can even assume evolution as a given until, that is, particular arguments are taken up for dispute. And in these same pieces, he can often express his skepticism and doubts also. It is also important to note that in addressing the question of evolution, as in the sample above, Orfield makes careful distinction between theism and Christianity. That is, he argues on the one hand that the upward progress of evolution is impossible apart from teleology or purpose, a fact which he comments would necessarily define evolution as a theistic concept. But he argues that to acknowledge evolution as theoretically possible within a theistic worldview is one thing. Affirming that it is a specifically Christian option is quite another. It would be interesting to go into that distinction there. It must be noted additionally that within his openness to the possibility of evolution thus considered, Warfield makes a pointed argument that evolution cannot by itself explain the world as it is. Here he makes careful distinction between creation, mediate creation, and evolution. Only creation can explain origins, he insists, and if God has providentially directed various developments of his created order, evolution, this process can never account for factors such as life, personality, consciousness, the human soul, Christ, and so on. Such realities as these require divine creative intrusions, mediate creation. Providence is not creation. What he, that is the Christian, needs to insist on is that providence cannot do the work of creation and is not permitted to intrude itself into the sphere of creation, much less to crowd creation out of the recognition of man, merely because it puts itself for forward under the new name of evolution. So I think he, it sounds like he would be an old earth creationist or possibly a young earth creationist with openness to old earth. Orfield was very insistent on this point. He specifically denied that evolution could account for everything after Genesis 1.1. Whatever evolution there might have been, it cannot account for the arrival of anything specifically new. It cannot arrive, explain the original stuff of the created order, and it cannot account for other subsequent realities that depend for their existence on divinely creative acts. Thus, for example, Warfield could never accept abiogenesis, a spontaneous generation of life, and he explicitly denied that evolution could account for life, the origin of the human soul, the human sense of morality, the continued existence of the soul, immortality, in the afterlife, or the incarnate Christ. Yet this careful distinction still leaves open the possibility of a theistic evolution carefully defined, and so it becomes necessary to address the specific questions that are determinative of Warfield's understanding. The short answer here is that Warfield remained both open to some kind of evolution within the prescribed limits and yet very skeptical of it. In agreement with his theological mentor, Charles Hodge, Warfield condemns Darwinian evolution as atheistic, and he complains often of the naturalistic and anti-supernaturalistic bias that drives so much of the evolutionist agenda, and that has rubbed off on the church. He understands the distinction between Darwinian evolution and other theories, although at times, as was increasingly the case generally, Orfield can use the term Darwinism and evolution interchangeably, but even so, he judges the evolutionary notion itself as essentially atheistic and comments that the whole body of these evolutionary theories is highly speculative and even hyper-speculative. 
Doesn't sound like he put much stock in them. None of them, he insists, have much obvious claim to be scientific. The whole body of evolutionary constructions prevalent today impresses us simply as a vast mass of speculation which may or may not prove to have a kernel of truth in it. Warfield insisted that any claim that evolution has been proved betrays an overly zealous enthusiasm that exceeds the evidence. And despite his frequent open tone regarding evolution, when he addresses the proffered evidence for it, he consistently speaks in a skeptical and often even mocking tone. Evolutionary theories, he insists, cry out with questions they cannot answer and rest on faulty logic, even of the most elementary sort. The lay reader, speaking inclusively of itself, of himself it seems, is left with a strong suspicion that if their writers did not put evolution into their premises, they would hardly find so much of it in their conclusions. The time has already fully come when the adherents of evolution should do something to make it clear to the lay mind that a full accumulation of facts to prove their case can never come, or else abate a little of the confidence of their primary assumption. Put up or shut up, kind of. Um, Warfield finds no evidence for abiogenesis. He also criticizes evolution on the grounds of the geological record. Likewise, he finds the appeal to embryology unable to account for the fact that supposed later stages of development retain a transcript of previous stages. So also the evolutionist faces difficulty, he says, with the limits to the amount of variation to which any organism is liable. Similarly, Wake Warfield makes much over the seemingly limitless and impossible demands that evolutionary theory makes on time. This, he notes, is becoming more of a problem recognized within the evolutionary scientific community itself. The matter of time that was a menace to Darwinism at the beginning thus bids fair to become its Waterloo. Warfield allows that the, that the age of the earth and the age of humanity, for that matter, are not questions of biblical or theological interest. Warfield is willing to allow an immense age of the earth and he's open to a great age of humanity also, but he notes the general consensus of his day that the age of man is probably not more than 20,000 years. And he contends often that science has not demonstrated the time it demands for the theory. Orfield speaks often along these lines in criticism of evolutionary theories, insisting throughout his career that evolution remains an unproven hypothesis. But is it likely that it will be proven? But is it not likely that it will be proven? It is, is it not in the least probable? He asks rhetorically, cannot prescient minds expect that proof will be forthcoming? He responds, many think so. Many more would like to think so, but for myself I am bound to confess that I have not such prescience. Evolution has not yet made the first step toward explaining many things. In an unprejudiced way, looking over the proofs evolution has offered, I am bound to say that none of them is at all, to my mind, stringent. He writes in 1908, what impresses, most impresses the layman as he surveys the whole mass of these evolutionary theories in the mass is their highly speculative character. If what is called science means careful observation and collection of facts and strict induction from them of the principles governing them, that is the old definition of science, none of these theories have much obvious claim to be scientific. Their speculative hypotheses set forth as possible or conceivable explanations of the facts. For ourselves, we confess frankly that the whole body of evolutionary constructions prevalent today impresses us simply as a, mass, a vast mass of speculation which may or may not prove to have a kernel of truth in it. This looks amazingly like basing facts on theory rather than theory on facts. In a 1916 review, Warfield speaks optimistically of evolution as demonstrating teleology or design. Embedded in the very concept of evolution, therefore, is the concept of end. Here he seems to be more open to evolution, but later in the same review he writes more critically of the woeful lack of proof for it. The discrediting of Darwin's doctrine of natural selection as the sufficient cause of evolution leaves the idea of evolution without proof so far as he is concerned leaves it, in a word, just where it was before he took the matter up. And there, speaking broadly, it remains until the present day. Evolution is then, a, if a fact, not a triumph of the scientist, but one of his toughest problems. He does not know how it has taken place. Every guess he makes, this is continuing that same paragraph, uh, is to 
as to how it has taken place proves inadequate to account for it. His main theories have to be supported by subsidiary theories to make them work at all. And these subsidiary theories, by yet more far-reaching subsidiary theories of the second rank, until the whole chart is like the Ptolemaic chart of the heavens written over the cycle and epicycle and appears ready to break down by its own weight. Doesn't sound very complimentary. So although Warfield can speak of evolution as theistically allowable, his skepticism remains, as do the biblical herders as he understands them. Of the specifically biblical problems, he sees God's creation of Eve as the most obvious, the account of which in Genesis 2 would seem impossible to reconcile with any evolutionary theory. But there are further problems he sees also, such as the origin of the human soul, the human sense of morality, the continued existence of the soul, immortality, and the afterlife, and the incarnate Christ, none of which can be accounted for on evolutionary grounds. It is common to hear it said that Warfield understood the creation days of Genesis 1 in terms of age, and this in order to allow time for evolutionary development. This rumor may have arisen from Warfield's openness to a very old earth, if such could be scientifically demonstrated, and his affirmation with Henry Green of gaps in the genealogy of Genesis 5 and 11. Remember, Warfield is writing this before the advent of radiometric dating. And so uh, that's one, one set of uh, data that he does not have to deal with. But it is, in fact, something Warfield nowhere affirms. Indeed, he explicitly rejects the view that all the days, that the days represent geological ages and the view that understands them as literal but representative days that stand at the end of a long process of development. And more generally, he comments in agreement with another author that the necessity for indefinitely protracted time does not arise from the facts, but from the attempt to explain the facts without any adequate cause. Warfield speaks similarly in 1908. That is, Warfield was very skeptical even of the time required for evolution. And as will be shown below, he tended to understand the age of humanity in terms of thousands, not millions of years. At any rate, beyond this, Warfield nowhere specifies his own understanding of the days of Genesis. Elements of theistic evolution that Warfield would not accept as consistent with the Christian faith. Warfield argues that there are observable gaps in the genealogy of Genesis 5 and 11, and thus that scripture does not speak to the age of the earth or of man. He insists that this is not a theological question, yet he seems to think, presumably on scientific grounds, that humanity cannot be more than 10,000 or perhaps 20,000 years old. This observation alone seems to rule out most any evolutionary theory of human origins. More to the point in his discussions of the evidence available to evolutionists, Warfield seems clearly to rule out the notion of a progressive rise of human forms, asserting that the earliest human remains differ in type in no respect from the men of our day. He scorns the evolutionary idea of primitive man. In Warfield's 1906 review of James Orr's The Image of God in Man, he notes Orr's argument that disparate development of mind and body is impossible and that it would be absurd to suggest an evolutionary development of the human body from a brutish, brutish source and a sudden creation of the soul by the divine fiat. Warfield commands Orr's grasp of man as body and soul in unity and refers to this as the hinge of the biblical anthropology. Warfield seems in obvious agreement, but in terms of the argument against evolution, he characterizes this as a minor point. That is, he does not think this argument will be effective given that it could be answered with the theory of evolution per saltum, or macroevolution, which is indistinguishable from old earth creationism. Two factors in context militate against taking this as a statement of Warfield's own belief, however. First, early in the same review, Warfield praises Orr for his courage to recognize and assert the irreconcilableness of the two views and the impossibility of a compromise between them, and that the Christian view is the only tenable one in the forum of science itself. Second, Warfield commends Orr's thesis explicitly. That he accomplishes this task with distinguished success is the significance of the volume. The book is a distinct contribution to the settlement of the questions with which it deals and to their settlement in a sane and stable manner. 
It will come as a boon to many who are oppressed by the persistent pressure upon them of the modern point of view. It cannot help producing in the mind of its readers a notable clearing of the air. It may be helpful to recall here Warfield's 1897 affirmation cited above that man came into the world just as the Bible says he did and his understanding of the creation of Eve as the leading obstacle to believing in evolution. We find the same tone in a student, N.W. Harkness, extensive 19, 1898 class notes from the Warfield lectures on the origin of man. So here you're getting something kind of taken down as notes. Here Warfield makes repeated references to Adam's creation from the dust by God in his image, God having breathed into him, into him the breath of life so as to make a, him a living being. Never is the plain understanding of the Genesis narrative questions. It is always taken at face value and treated as both theology and historic fact. Several times Warfield is quoted as speaking of evolution as the modern speculation that runs athwart the biblical record. Orfield concedes, as throughout his writings, that evolution and creation are not necessarily mutually exclusive so long as evolution is not understood in, in reference to origins. Man is not improved, improved organic matter, but was created new out of nothing, the intrusion of divine power for something entirely new, Harkness records his professor as saying. At this point, evolution cannot be reconciled to scripture. To agree with us, Warfield argues, the evolutionist must admit that the chain was broken at one or more points by intrusion of divine power. We must insist, he says, that man was created. Warfield further instructed his students that Adam was created perfect and that this perfection must be t in understood in physical as well as moral terms. This material from the student's lecture notes is in keeping with what we find in Warfield's lecture itself, prepared originally in 1888, in which he explicitly affirms that Adam is the first man and that Adam and Eve were created in a fully developed moral sense and in moral perfection, that in Adam the human race stood on probation and fell into sin, and that an evolutionary model would seem to reverse the biblical order of original perfection followed by sinlessness. All this from Warfield's lectures in, is in keeping with what we have of his published writings. Warfield touches on the question of the origin of human death only briefly in his review of James Orr's God's Image in Man, and he expresses surprise at Orr's ambivalence on this question. The problem of the reign of death in that creation which was cursed for man's sake and which is to be with man delivered from the bondage of corruption presses on some with a somewhat greater weight than seems here, referring to Orr, to be recognized. Warfield does not here state this explicitly as his own belief. He says the problem presses on some, which of course might include himself. And in fact, he never failed to point out a better argument for either side in this destruction in discussion. But he clearly considers this a strong argument for Orr's position that he should have employed. It is also significant that Warfield here in his 1906 Orr review describes the fallenness and hostility of this present world as the reign of death in that creation which was cursed for man's sake. That is, he seems to indicate that not just human death, but also the general fallenness of the larger creature, created order, excuse me, came about as, Adam, as a result of Adam's sin. Commenting on Luke 13.1 and following, he says, on the other hand, your questioner in the Bible class apparently argues on the assumption that there is no necessary relation between sin and calamity. He seems to suppose that calamity can fall where there is, when there is no sin. In other words, he has forgotten, as many forget nowadays, the fall. Given the fall and there is a place for the use of calamity in the moral government of the world, God may then visit or withhold the suffering which is due all as best suits his ends. If there had been no fall, however, there should, would be no such use made of calamity, which means calamity before a fall makes no sense in that setting. And then he dis this discusses after their kind, which is a pretty standard discussion. Moreover, given one Jarf Warfield's general assessment of evolution is speculative, two, his expressed acceptance of the Genesis record elsewhere, three, his criticism of abiogenesis and his insistence that life is a divinely created act, something that specifically new, something specifically new that evolution cannot accomplish. And for his observations that the fossil record provide 
no indication of transitional forms, and I see that there should, 38 should be uh, superscript. It is safe to assume that he held to God's direct intervention in the creation of animal kinds. Warfield's thinking on these defining issues is rather traditional. We may say in summary that Warfield held the following. The creation of Adam from the dust of the ground, the creation of Eve from Adam, that Adam and Eve were the original pair, that Adam and Eve were not highly developed animals, that all humanity is descended from Adam and Eve, that humanity was created in moral and physical perfection, that sin entered humanity by Adam, that humanity has not progressed from primitive man upward but has fallen because of sin that human death entered by Adam, that the created order itself is in disarray because of Adam's sin, and that the arrival of the animal world as it is also required divine creative intervention. In his book, Biblical and Theological Introduction, pardon me, in his, in his Biblical and Theological Introduction to this book, Wayne Grudem, we remember from before, has enumerated 12 points at which theistic evolution as currently endorsed differs from the biblical account. We can review these 12 points and describe Warfield's understanding regarding each. One, Adam and Eve were not the first human beings and perhaps they never even existed. Warfield would deny this. He affirmed that Adam and Eve were historic persons and were the original human pair. Two, Adam and Eve were born from human parents. Warfield would deny this. He affirmed that repeatedly that Adam and Eve were created by God as the first human pair. Three, God did not act directly or specially to create Adam out of, the, out of dust from the ground. Warfield would deny this. It's pretty obvious. Uh, God did not cre directly create Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side. Warfield would deny this. He affirmed that Eve's creation from Adam was the leading obstacle to a Christian's embracing of evolution. Five, Adam and Eve were never sinless human beings. Warfield would deny this. Six, Adam and Eve did not create the first human sins, for human beings were doing morally evil things long before Adam and Eve. Warfield would deny this. Two, seven, human death did not begin as a result of Adam's sin, for human beings existed long before Adam and Eve, and they were always subject to death. Warfield seemed to deny this. He seemed to affirm that death came to humanity and to the created order by Adam's sin. And it seemed pretty strongly, actually. Um, not all human beings have descended from Adam and Eve, for there were thousands of other human beings on earth at the time that God chose two of them as Adam and Eve, assuming there was a first pair. Orfield would definitely deny this. God did not directly act in the natural world to create different kinds of fish, birds, and land animals. Orfield would deny this. God did not rest from his work in creation or stop any special creative activity after plants, animals, and human beings appeared on the earth. Warfield would deny this. He affirmed, the God's, he affirmed God's rest on the seventh day. And for this audience, it's probably worth quoting Warfield. He who needed no rest in the greatness of his condescension rested from the work which he had creatively made that by his example he might woo man to his needed rest. The Sabbath, then, is not an invention of man's, but a creation of God's. God rested not because he was weary or needed an intermission in his labors, but because he had completed the tax he had set for himself, we speak as a man, and had completed it well. And God finished the work which he had made, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God never created an originally very good natural world in the sense of a world that was safe environment, free from thorns and thistles and similar harmful things. This is getting back to theistic evolution claims. Warfield would deny this. And finally, after Adam and Eve sinned, God did not place any curse on the world that changed the workings of the natural world and made it more hostile to mankind. Warfield would deny this. So basically, Warfield would deny everything that modern theistic evolutionists would claim. Warfield in transition. One question remains, did Warfield change his position later in life? The notion that Warfield was a theistic evolution is common, fueled especially by various works by David Livingston and Mark Knoll, Mark Knoll being the person who wrote that first note, or the one reference in that first note. Um, 
most notably in their collection of Warfield's writings in evolution, science, and scripture, selected writings. And that last thing should be italicized. Livingston and Knoll argued that Warfield's position on this question changed, that late in his career he came again to embrace an evolutionary theory of origins. I've addressed this point at greater length elsewhere, but I can make a few summary remarks here. First, all sides acknowledge that Warfield's lecture, Evolution on Development, prepared in 1888, reflects his clear skepticism regarding the theory. At least six observations are worthy of note here. One, it would be possible to trace sentiments of Warfield's skepticism expressed here through his later writings also. Two, Warfield's later positive statements about, the evolution, about evolution are substantially substantively no more positive or open than some found in his 1888 lecture. If we agree that in 1888 he was also skeptical of evolution, then his later allowances can scarcely indicate anything more. This observation is especially relevant given Warfield's continued expression of skepticism. Both his openness to evolution and his skepticism regarding it continued to the last. Three, it appears that Warfield continued to use this 1888 lecture with various emendations, at least through 1902, when he began to share the teaching load with C.W. Hodge, Jr., who eventually succeeded him and whose lectures, inter interestingly, followed Warfield's closely. Some of the emendations Warfield added to the lecture along the way seem to, in fact, to reflect a strengthening of his convictions against evolution, not a weakening. Five, we have no later or replacement lecture from Warfield on this topic. This was the last he used, and he preserved, it, he preserved it along with his other works to be examined by those coming after him. And six, for a theologian, of the st I think it should read of the stature of Warfield, but that's the way it is in the book. For a theologian, the statue, stature of Warfield to change course after passing the age of 50 on an issue so well studied and on which he had pronounced so often and so clearly would be remarkable indeed. I don't see any evidence for it. One major factor lending confusion to the question of Warfield's later commitments regarding evolution is a 1915 essay on Calvin's doctrine of creation in which Warfield argued that Calvin understood the work of the creation week, uh, Genesis 1, in evolutionary terms. On the face of it, this may seem to reflect Orfield's own persuasion. Why else would he make such an unprecedented claim regarding the reformer? But there is more to the story. In this essay, Warfield points out that Calvin held to a literal six-day creation week and a young earth of less than 6,000 years. So we must at least say that in his famous, or notorious, claim that Calvin's doctrine of creation was an evolutionary one, Warfield makes no connection to any evolutionary theory current in his own day. There's not enough time allowed. More substantively, what Warfield refers to as evolution in this essay is nothing more than second causes which God employed in forming the world. Of course, Calvin would have no idea of Darwin's theory of evolution, which was published nearly 300 years after Calvin's death. Warfield argues that, for Calvin, creation proper refers only to the original fiat of Genesis 1-1 and to the origin of each human soul. God created the original world stuff, and it is from this that the rest of the created order was brought forth and formed. Clearly, Warfield uses the term evolution somewhat loosely here. Indeed, one year later, Warfield insisted that evolution necessarily entailed teleology, purpose, mind, intelligence, and therefore a designer. He argues that, given the current rejection of natural selection, evolution is left without explanation. Then he offers his latest, his final assessment of the various evolutionary theories. The discrediting of Darwin's doctrine of natural selection as a sufficient cause of evolution leaves the idea of evolution without proof. And there, speaking broadly, it remains until the present day. Evolution is then, a, if a fact, not a triumph of the scientist, but one of his toughest problems. Finally, we must note that in a 1916 piece written for the college newspaper, Warfield reminisces on his time as an undergraduate student in Princeton. Here, Warfield affirms that he was a convinced theistic evolutionist in his teenage years when he entered the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton. But he also affirms that he had abandoned the theory by the time he was 30 years old. That would be 1881. 
That is, although theistic evolution was championed by his revered professor and college president, James McCosh, Orfield says that he had outgrown it himself early on, and the clear implication is that as he was writing now at age 67, just four years before his death, his evolutionary beliefs remained a thing of the past. Conclusion. The claim that Orfield held to theistic evolution goes beyond the evidence. Throughout the years of his writing on the subject, Orfield spoke with marked openness and even allowance of evolution. Many of these statements were obviously made simply for the sake of argument, and many are not so obvious. But it must be recognized that all along, at the very same time and through to the end, Orfield spoke very critically of evolution, pointing out the obstacles to accepting it, characterizing it as mere speculation, and commending refutations of it, such as Orr's. He spoke with evidently genuine openness to the idea, and this is doubtless the source of the confusion on the question. In fact, it may be said that the confusion is Warfield's own fault. But his openness to evolution is only half the picture, for all along he spoke critically of its purely speculative nature. And in fact, he said late in life that he had left it in his youth. Moreover, he very clearly held that Adam and Eve created from Adam with historical persons, that they were created perfect, that the entire human race is descended from them, that theirs was the first human sin, and that the human race and all creation with it is fallen in Adam. This would seem to rule out theistic evolution as we understand it today, and in fact it must be admitted that it would be impossible to identify any theory of evolution that Warfield himself held. Again, the claim that Warfield held to theistic evolution goes beyond the evidence. Indeed, the claim seems to go against the evidence. We may say this in summary. Warfield seemed very open to evolution and spoke allowingly of it, Orfield at the same time was very critical of evolution, questioned its scientific grounding, mocked its speculative nature and logical fallacies, and recognized the biblical obstacles to it. Indeed, his last assumes, assessment of evolutionary theories is sharply critical. It would be impossible to identify any specific evolutionary theory that Warfield allegedly held. Warfield did not hold to the essentials of any theistic evolutionary theory held today, as enumerated in Grudem's 12 points above. Warfield asserted in 1916 that he had left theistic evolution behind him years earlier. There, it seems, we must leave it also. Now, my take on all this, I think Fred Zaspel makes a good case that B.B. Warfield had a skeptical attitude to evolution. Uh, it appears that any evolution he might countenance uh, was friendly to intelligent design. Thus, for the theistic evolutionists the book is aiming at, against, B.B. Warfield should not offer significant comfort. Why should we care about B.B. Warfield? Well, because he, he could be wrong. You know, The reason why is because theistic evolutionists care. And they've written several papers on this kind of thing. Um, Remember the failure of the experiment of liberalism and modernism resulting in what we call fundamentalism and evangelicalism. And depending on whose de definitions you're using, they may or may not be the same. I think the big sticking point right now is does fundamentalism include inerrantism? I think it does. Uh, does evangelicalism include inerrantism? And some people would say no. But, you see, B.B. Warfield was a fundamentalist as well as an evangelical. Modern theistic evolutionists sometimes claim to be evangelical, and they want exceptions with acceptance within the evangelical community. That's why it's important to them. They feel like they're second-class Christians, and much the way that uh, some who do not accept the... Uh, a short age for life on earth feel like second class Adventists sometimes um, and complain bitterly about it. Inspiration, infallibility, inerrancy are those the same thing? Um, well, it depends on your nuances and inerrancy and apparently somebody who felt strongly about the inerrancy of the biblical record could say, well, maybe a theistic evolution of some particular stripe could possibly be uh, an answer to how the Bible fits with 
the world history. Theistic evolution might be within the in inerrantist framework, and that's the, that's the advantage that B.B. Warfield gives to somebody who wants to be a theistic evolutionist. This chapter argues that Genesis 2 must be taken as authoritative, and if it, does, it is, then the theistic evolution that the book is aiming at falls apart. Um, and actually, Genesis 1 needs to be accepted except for the days, and interestingly enough, B.B. Warfield doesn't feel like the days uh, are well explained without them being 24-hour consecutive days, which means that he would be happiest with a standard short-age creationism. Uh, theistic evolution is just not compatible with that position, period. Now, that brings up a question of how do we do theology? There are, one way of doing theology is to try to build walls around certain positions because one is afraid of the slippery slope and you've got to stop people from getting too far down because if they keep going down, it'll get worse and worse and then they slide their way to ruin. And that's happened, so it's not an irrational fear. But there is a feeling sometimes that as long as you stay within the walls, you can take any position you want. You're within the limits, and so if somebody wants to take a position right next to the wall where it would be easy to slide down further if necessary, um, you're good. And I find that to be not a good way of doing theology. I think that truth is not a matter of defining stuff and then defining it further. I think it's more like truth is attractive. Which means that the slippery slope actually can turn out to be an advantage rather than a disadvantage as people slide towards the truth if they find it attractive. If you don't find the truth attractive, then why bother building the walls? It's, uh, your position is hopeless anyway. Sooner or later, everybody will slide down. And I think that truth is not compatible with evolution, either the atheistic variety or the uh, or the theistic evolution variety. I rather suspect that truth will not turn out to be completely compatible with the uh, uh, with the theistic uh, with the uh, theistic evolution that is friendly to intelligent design, or for that matter, w with a short age, or pardon me, with the long age, and that uh, the short age creationism is the only thing that will really be compatible with the truth. Certainly, the biblical record seems to argue that way. Uh, and at some point, I think we may have to choose. And if we do, we are better off choosing the truth. And in fact, in that case, walls may actually be counterproductive because they discourage people from climbing over them. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment in the back there. <clears throat> several hours studying with a Jewish rabbi who informed me that the definition of Messiah is anyone who brings peace on earth. I asked if Adolf Hitler would qualify, and he said yes, given the requirement to bring peace on earth. You can look for truth in strange places. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can comment on that one. <laughs> it's the argumentum well, ad Hitlerum. Let me amplify it with another experience. As a young preacher, 
I always felt it necessary in fulfilling Ellen White's counsel to work for other Protestant or other ministers. And always, in whichever town I lived, set up a collegial relationship, and we had monthly meetings and so forth. But one Methodist minister spoke to me after I gave a nice illustration on what Adventists believed, that he didn't always believe the teachings of his church, but he was close to retirement. But he did take a set of Bible studies from me and presented them all to his Methodist church. So I think he was honest in heart. But again, humanity interfered. I, I think that that's possibly one example of where you really don't want the walls to be too high. And you want the truth to be attractive rather than uh, rather than trying to stake out theological territory that you're safe within. Those pastors felt it not too strenuous to switch denominations right along. And it was just something they did. They didn't join the Adventist church, to my knowledge. <laughs> there are some natural walls that you can't lower too much. One of them is coming to church on a, a different day. Explain what you mean by the wall just a little more. Well, there is a recognition that there's a slippery slope. That if you go past a certain point, you can keep going and you can keep going and you can keep going. And there is no natural stopping point. And so some people will try to say, if you go beyond this point, you know, you're likely to just keep sliding. I, the, the slippery slope can be illustrated probably best by the life of, uh, uh, of uh, Howard Van Til, who was a, a, uh, the son of Cornelius Van Til, who was a renowned Dutch Reformed theolo theologian. And... Howard Van Til started out as a very much a a long age creationist, and then with time it became clear that what he was talking about was more evolutionary than creationist, and that uh, he became a an ardent advocate of what he termed fully gifted creationism, which is to say God created the heavens and the earth, and once he did that, he didn't have to lay a finger on it after that. It just kind of kept right on gradually evolving through the laws he had already set up. And with time, it became more and more difficult to maintain that position. And with the choices he had already made, it was easier to slide completely over into an atheist position. In our own church, uh, you can witness what happened to Robert Brinsmead, who some of you may remember was a very, very conservative Adventist, uh, got talked into recognizing that that particular brand of Adventism didn't have answers to some of the important questions. Apparently Desmond Ford had a large hand in that. And uh, then switched over into becoming a, you might call a liberal Adventist. But as time went on, again started drifting further and further out, and finally has become basically an atheist. So the slippery slope does exist, and it is a question of what do you do to combat it? And see, there are two basic ways of combating it. One of them is to say, don't go beyond this point. If you go beyond this point, you're going to slide down. And that's what I'm referring to by erecting walls. Um, the other way of combat uh, combating it, which I think is the better way, is to turn on the magnet. 
And then instead of sliding downhill, people slide uphill. The problem with the slippery slope is not the slope, it's gravity. You reverse gravity, suddenly the whole problem disappears. It's the attractiveness that needs to be there that pulls people to the center instead of allowing them to slide downhill. And that's kind of what I'm referring to. It's a metaphor, but and you may judge as to how good a metaphor it is. But. Yes, comment uh, behind. A question or comment was around the illusion of walls. Uh, walls are, I think, at least intellectually built at boundaries that the builder is not sure are defensible. And uh, often attempt to prevent people from moving, from exploring beyond their boundaries. And uh, it's been interesting within our own confession to see the wall builders versus those who are perhaps versus isn't right, but there, there were also those who were sure enough that uh, you could find a position that, that was clearly defensible, but that it might not be within the precision of a boundary guarded by a wall. I think you're right. There's a danger you build the wall in the wrong place. Um, but I think that there's also... Uh, the antidote cannot be a wall. Because walls stop things from flowing up as well as stop things from flowing down. Um, and I think the best way to do it is to just simply allow the natural terrain, because there are valleys and ridges that are that are there whether you like it or not. Uh, to give you an example of a what you might call a natural wall, it, you can try to extend the uh, extend the history of uh, humankind and of animals and, and such out to perhaps, you know, well, 6,000, where does it fall within there? Maybe 7,500 because you're taking the Septuagint. Uh, maybe you, you accept the possibility of gaps in the, uh, in the uh, genealogies. So maybe it will slide out to 10,000. Maybe it will slide out to 20,000. You get beyond a hundred thousand, you know, you're you're really in no man's land until you get to, you know, about uh, a million, two million years for humanity, and uh, um, five hundred thousand years for complex life, uh, five hundred million years for complex life, and five and. Three billion years for life itself, and there is another kind of natural valley. Pointing out that there are there is this topography is not the same as building a wall. Building a wall is to say, here's where the wall stands, and you'd better not go out of it, or you will lose community with us. Um, and uh, I think that there are some there are kind of natural features that are reasonable to accept, but I think that when you start trying to build on top of that um, extra artificial barriers, um, you begin to look like what is really the case, that is that you are afraid of of uh, that your position really isn't defensible. I agree with that. 
I think it's a comment um, behind, and then there's another one, one here, and then we'll come back. One, one further comment. That is, having been around this for a while, and at a time, I don't know how many here are familiar with what Briscoe used to be, mm -hmm. um, including many from Adventist education in North America and other places. Uh, I remember so distinctly one lunch with a couple of uh, general conference uh, position holders, well, pardon me, a bad term, but anyway, GC people who were there, and we got into our shared concern over Adventist young people, and uh, I was, I'll, we'll never forget the discussion that went well. When a, lo when a young person comes out through all of this intellectual minefield, you might say, and has an, a still clearly functioning belief in Genesis in terms of God's creatorship, etc. cetera, uh, if, if they leave with that background, have we accomplished anything? If they don't agree with all of the boundaries defined by walls, the answer was pretty discouraging. It said that they said absolutely not. You either keep them within those walls, or you failed. That's been an attitude that was has been around for a long time. Yes, it has. A comment behind, and then over here, and then Ariel Roth. I appreciate the idea of attractiveness. And in my own mind, I am looking for clarity about, well, I'll use, I'll use a term um, that came from Richard Rohr of Dominican versus Franciscan. The Dominican way, he said, was mind against mind. The Franciscan way, we'll pray with you. No more fighting which today means cooperate, be nice, be loving. It's called loving. Um, don't discuss things that divide. That is attractive. And so I'm hearing you speak of another way of attraction, the beauty of truth itself. How do we make this clear in a world that is putting away logic in many ways? Perhaps someone can ask my question better than this. It's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, to, to me, the Franciscan way leaves something to be desired, but so does the Dominican way. And I, I think there is a need for a, a better model than either one of those. Comment? I, it would be nice if the world could turn out that way. <laughs> um, we can't even turn out that way in our little groups, uh, let alone the world. Um, but we still try to do it in our families, create that world we want to see out there. Um, this idea of walls. People join the Adventist church. They join uh, whatever other club they join. And they join it for a reason. And it's because they, they agree with that church or club's positions on things. You know, people join the Adventist Church because they like our positions on things. And I've heard people up front uh, kind of mock in a derisive manner. Uh, oh, how many um, how many uh, Adventist beliefs are there? Twenty five, twenty four. Uh -huh. Who cares? You know, and they they just like. But we join things because. There are beliefs, and that belief becomes a 
not a wall, but a fence. You can take a fence and you can talk over it, talk through it, mm -hmm. but it's still a, a point of reference. And so I thought about Christ says, I am the way, and he takes us not through a wall, but he takes us through a gate into a structure that's enclosed by a wall. And so there are walls and then there are walls, and, and we've got to learn how to uh, talk about walls as they're made plain in Scripture. We can't forever be talking about uh, things and always changing and always changing, and, and that's what I see is happening in the Adventist church. Uh, they take this idea that, uh, you know, truth is advancing, advancing, advancing. And I, I agree, truth advances. And what I see happening in my church now, my big church, you know, is the people taking advantage of this whole mistrust in authority. And they're... They're trying to say there's more yet. There's more, there's more. And so where do they go for more? They go into politics. They go into, um, they go into the social gospel. They go into, what's, what's the other name? And I just heard it today in the sermon. The social justice. They, they mention that like they know what it is. And I don't think they know what it is this whole social justice that's going on in the world. At any rate, I think people need some kind of uh, wall or fence that takes them into a safe enclosure, mm -hmm. not where they never hear anything different, but they know what they believe. You know, yeah. the, the world accuses Christianity itself of being a big wall. Yeah. And so this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. We just need to, to learn how to deal with it. Well, my own my own feeling now that I'm thinking about it a little more. What I what I would rather point out is that there are boundary markers. You get beyond this point, and the pull is going to be in this direction. You get over in this point, the pull is going to be in that direction. And you know, at about a hundred thousand years, for human life is one particular area where you get. If you're shorter than that, you're going to be wound, wind up being pulled shorter and shorter. And it's an argument as to whether you're going to wind up at 10,000 or 7,500 or 6,000 years or wherever. But, but, but that's going to be the direction of the pull. If you go on the other side, the direction of the pull is going to be out towards millions of years. Right now, if you believe the Crete uh, footprints, it's going to be towards 5.7 million years. Um, because that's what happens once you go in a certain direction there's a question of what you consider the most important ways of, of ascertaining time and dates and you know if you go in the, that direction that's where you're going to get wind up getting pulled you go in the other direction you're going to be pulled in the opposite direction that's just the way it is and, and that's that's not creating a wall. That's simply putting a boundary marker as to this is where what the territory looks like. Um, and there are a number of things. In fact, one of these days, I, it might be worthwhile uh, kind of looking over the entire terrain and finding where those kind of centers of gravity are and, and where people tend to, to rest if they go in a certain position, you know, uh, and it's and th that's useful, but it's more it's more marking the territory that's already there than it is trying to create extra walls that, you know, if you stay in here you're okay, and if you stay out there you're not okay, and something like that. Uh, I guess we have one more comment here before the mic comes down. Oh, oh did my, you? I I can. Add a comment to this gentleman's comment here, who happens to be my dad. So, you know, when it comes to, when I'm thinking of my own kids, I have um, an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old. Uh, my, my concern is not them sliding, it's having a place to slide from. 
And I don't think uh, it, in a lot of ways our institutions and our schools are giving our kids a place to slide from. That is where, where well, this is the, dis, the disadvantage of, of just talking about love and not, and not actually dealing with the problems. Uh, because if you, if you never talk about the problems, then you're right. You let, people, you let people just kind of float around with no, no place to stand at all to, to, right. to begin their journey. We, we've talked a lot about the, the desire for intellectual freedom within the walls and how close you can get as what I see it as a trained professional. How much of that freedom do you extend to a 13-year-old? Who needs a place to slide from? Yeah. And I think that attitude is imbued onto the young kids, and they'll, they'll, what hope is there then? And so that's why I'm, I'm uncomfortable building an extra wall on the, on the, on the doorstep. The, thus far can you go and no further. I would rather say, and this is why I find it attractive to be on this side. These yeah, are the that positives that definition. pull me in. Because I think that's, that's what we need really. But if we never talk about the positives that pull me in, then our children are our mentees, as we will uh, we'll or have learned from the sermon, don't have any, any place to start from. And I think that that is just as bad in some ways as building walls because leaving people with no idea of what kind of a structure of the landscape they're, they're in uh, I think is uh, in some ways worse. Put them at the top of the slippery slope as high as you can put them and teach them why they're there and the attractiveness of why they're there. Yes, and the attractiveness of why they're there because that's the key. If you don't have attractiveness, then just trying to make, uh, you know, mechanical ways of not allowing you to do anything. We're twins, so I'll, I'll finish the thought. You have more <laughs> no. I, that's, that's true. Um, as illustrated by recent events in our, in our community, kids were suddenly, premeditatedly hit with something that none of them had been taught about. Well, they knew about stuff. These kids today know about stuff. But going up through our schools and they never ever are taught about, about things in the sexual realm and then all of a sudden something hits and we've got kids that weren't started at the top. They have no idea where to go. Yeah. Uh, comment down here now. Uh, Ar Ariel Roth has been waiting patiently. <laughs> Hardly worth waiting for, but uh, uh, walls are useful uh, in preserving identity. A church is entitled to its identity and so on, but your walls have to be vulnerable. They have to be, you have to allow them to be tested. They will not hold up unless you allow them to be tested. Uh, the, a church can, of course, waste its whole time testing its walls uh, without doing uh, uh, the major work of trying to save others. On the other hand, uh, we have these walls but we ought to say, these things hold up, and this is why, and uh, this is why that we've decided, and so on, and this is uh, a rational basis, and you have your doubts, uh, you're entitled to it, but look at the data, and uh, pick the model that makes the most sense. And so, uh, well, you know, I, I think you walls are useful, but don't ever say that you can't test them. 
allow investigation. And if the walls don't hold up, you want to get rid of them, of course. Although, of course, if the wall is taken that way, it basically becomes a marker of the uh, of the divide, not a wall itself. Because you're not you're not erecting stuff in the way. Uh, say a little more. I'm not. Uh... Uh, well, okay. <clears throat> A wall, as I'm using it, is an attempt to keep people from going going over what you might call an arbitrary limit. Um, in that sense, you can erect the wall wherever you choose. Making a marker on what is essentially a divide is not the same as erecting a wall. It's recognizing the natural divide. Yeah, well, you, but you, you don't want to uh, say everything is. Uh, we're not going to draw any lines in here anywhere, right? Uh, when the evidence is against it. Yeah. No, I agree with that. So I, uh, I plead for uh, have a broad outlook as you erect your walls. Allow them to be subjective to a broad testing, and I think you'll come up with the most reasonable truth that is possible, and that's what you want. Comment here and then over here. Um, did I hear you mention magnet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If indeed we, ha if indeed the magnet is Christ, then yeah. wall is not needed. After spending 16 years in Adventist schooling, I spent four years in a Catholic school. And Sabbath was never so attractive to me. That I longed for Sabbath is when I was not in an Adventist school. I had Jewish classmates. One guy, Steve Grossman, says, Charles, you're a heathen. Sabbath is mine. Here you keep the Sabbath, and you come back on Monday morning, you're as fresh as a flower. And here I am, I've been to all the nightclubs, and da da da. And the guy memorized Pentateuch as a little kid growing up in New York. Um, what's the choice we make? Uh, to me, if uh, the magnet is Christ, turn it. Yeah, where you live, where I live, Sometimes we see young people in the wearing a tie and a white, sh uh, shirt, white shirt and a black pair of pants. I'm talking about Mormons. Mm -hmm. These young people go out all over the world and they do not leave their church. The attrition rate is much lesser than us Seventh-day Adventists. What has happened to us? Our, our pastors don't believe in the 28 <laughs> fundamental truths, whereas our Muslim friends share with us 20 of them, and the uh, Protestants, only 13 of them. Excuse me, who do we have more uh, uh, common grounds with? You see, so, so the thing is that little by little we are forgetting who we are. Um, Fundamentalism, you mentioned that I uh, really, truly really liked what was there. That Wikipedia is also Merriam Webster Dictionary. I think it's almost word for word, same thing. Yeah, they uh, probably got it from there. 2017, um, January 17, the Adventist Review had, the, had an article, the front page, it said Adventists are not fundamentals, really. Uh, after a group of theologians got together, wrote this article. I go check it out, it's there. Um, we have a power coming up on the other side uh, in Europe that's talking about um, the world is so bad now we have to control the economy. We have to control the economy. Don't we see uh, Revelation chapter mm -hmm. 13 coming up? Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the uh, world is falling apart. We have to control uh, the, uh, the, the poverty. 
But then the final thing is really we have to save the environment. So the, uh, uh, the WHO uh, the, uh, comes up with a 2030 vision that we're going to control every single country in this world and how things happen. Don't we see this? What are we talking about from our pulpits? Amen, brother. Well, what are we talking about? Listen, um, January, the same date, in fact, January 17, 2017, um, our beloved president had a bunch of, uh, by the way, I'm not, uh, I like the man, okay, but he had a bunch of um, Protestant leaders, uh, he met with them, he says, this nonsense of 2000, I mean, uh, the Johnson Amendment of 1957, uh, the, where the churches cannot accept any uh, money from the government that cannot talk about uh, politics. This has to be done away with. That's number one. Number two, he says, church and state separation, I'll do everything I can to stop this, that end this church and state separation. What are we talking about from our pulpits? What are we talking about? What binds us together as a family anymore? Who studies... Who is watching what's happening around the world? What kind of a time are we living in? Now, truth is not progressive. Our understanding of the truth is progressive. We have got to understand who we are. We are not going to lose our children. More children are going to come yeah. to. I'm done. Well, if we find, if we find that, that truth has a beauty and attractiveness all of its own, then I think that a lot of these problems become much less. I won't say they disappear, but I will say they looked at it in a new light. For example, in the, in the area of, of faith and science, if we understand what the landscape is, and if we find ourselves attracted to a belief that the Bible is actually reasonably accurate, and that not only is it reasonably accurate, but it is at least possible to sometimes demonstrate that accuracy scientifically, then we will find ourselves attracted to the idea of putting some of the comments of the Bible to the test. And when the, uh, they repeatedly pass those tests, um, and we have to be careful of not setting it up to fail, which is one of the problems that we run into, uh, and that is, in, you know, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, for my own sake, uh, looking at carbon-14 dating from an entirely new perspective has enabled me to find things that are now starting to become com uh, more common knowledge, at least. Uh, I'm comfortable saying, you know, if you, if, you, if you do a fair test, it'll work. And at that point, I find it extremely attractive to say, and look at all the other stuff that is backing this kind of thing up, genetic entropy, um, soft tissue and dinosaurs, um, paleo uh, currents, uh, paraconformities, and especially paraconformities was soft sediment deformation, which means that the sediment had to sit there unconsolidated for millions of years, which just makes no sense at all. It's those kinds of things that make you comfortable saying, you know, and this is something that be, can be transmitted to other people, one's children, but also uh, other people's children, um, uh, other people in general, that this is no longer something that we have to hide and protect from the environment which is threatening it, that it actually needs to be let out and and become more powerful. Um, and, you know, my own response is that wherever I can make a difference, I will make that difference. Um, 
and that we will no longer sit there afraid of what might get us, but more comfortable with where we might go from here. It allows for research. It allows for people to start looking at, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's coming out of the, uh, uh, of the on, the on the layers of various uh, kinds that go across for hundreds of miles with the same, same layers, the same micro layers. I mean, it is incredible. And and to and again, stop and say, well, if it was really dumped that fast, you shouldn't see a lot of churning. Uh, from bio uh, turbation, and in fact, we do see that, and we and we don't see, you know, the kinds of the kinds of disruption that you would expect from either long subsidence under the water or even worse, long subsidence in the land. If you look at the ocean floor today, it's bioturbated to the max, and and so there are all these. There are all these uh, research projects that can pop up that can that you can actually go out and look for, and we have been slow to realize that. I think partly because we've had a little bit of a fortress mentality, to where we're afraid that if we expose our our beliefs to testing, that somehow they will come out not uh, not being sound, and. And then, and then, when we do find those things, we need to be careful of how we how we spread it, but to spread it nevertheless. That you know, here's an area where it looks like we're ahead, and we just we have not been good at transmitting that to our uh, spiritual children either, our mentees, if you want to call it that. Can I make a quick comment? Can, can I put the microphone away? Uh, I just took a German. Uh, we, we, Is it okay? Because I don't want to do it. Well, I'll tell you what. Save it for after the class yeah. then. <laughs> because uh, because it, they, it may pick up anyway. I'm wondering whether, looking back at the life of Christ, whether he was uh, trying to modify some walls uh, that uh, were occurring uh, in the religious uh, situation that he found himself in. Uh, it certainly looks like uh, you know tearing down the wall of separation was uh, was considered a good thing by the Apostle Paul, and that you can argue that the that uh, Jesus was doing the same kind of thing with uh, uh, the Samaritan woman, with the Canaanite woman. Uh, both of whom were not only not Jews, but they were women on top of it. Um, and and so you, I think you do see a uh, an attempt to to be more inclusive, um, recognizing people whose major search was for truth. Um, I. <clears throat> People always have minor searches, so I'm not sure that any either of those two were perfect when they were searching. But they were certainly they found the truth attractive, and and this is this is where I think we need to be careful if if our theology depends largely upon setting up firm boundaries that nobody can cross. Um, that's actually a defensive position. And our job is not primarily defensive to save all our kids or to save our church or anything like that. It is to preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Yes? There's a certain human perverseness um, that plays into all of this stuff. I mean, um, certainty any kind of certainty is viewed as arbitrary uh, by perverse human beings. And I think that a lot of, some of this is just the product of just our sinful nature and also the fact that children often are not nurtured up in, in, in the teachings and the traditions of the family like they used to be. Um, and, and I think there's a great deal of phobia of, of any kind of defensiveness or arbitrariness 
and, and it's viewed as a hostile thing rather than just as, as a, a belief. Well, I think that there are two kinds of certainty, one of which you work yourself up to and the other one of which comes naturally. I'm going to be certain even if... No matter what no matter the evidence what. is. And yeah. yet there are things where, you know, I write checks, I, uh, I you pull out my plastic card and, you, and could something happen that it no longer works? Well, yes, it could. But I don't worry about it. Just like I don't worry about floating off into the ceiling. Because it's the you know, the uniform experience has been that that's the way it's gonna be and while it theoretically could happen, I don't worry about it. That kind of certainty I think is probably a little more uh attractive to kids than the kind of certainty you have to make up. Oh, sure. But I mean, I mean, there are some things that all evidence is clear on, but once somebody begins to, to support that too loudly, then it's viewed as arbitrary. And I, I think that that's just a perverseness that we have. Well... I think that uh, you know, next week we're going to have some fun with C.S. Lewis and Higher Criticism. And uh, so I invite you to come back. And um, then the week after we'll have uh, Warren Johns. And uh, uh, at this point we'll close Sabbath School and we'll see you again.